This is a paid promotion for history. Buckle up because History's Car Week is back for its second year. It's bigger, louder, and faster than ever before. The week kicks off with Evil Live, where Travis Pastrana will attempt to recreate three of Evil Knievel's most dangerous stunts. Jumping 52 cars, 16 buses, and Caesar's Palace Fountain. Car Week continues tonight at 8, 7 central on History. Go to history.com slash car week for more info. And in honor of History's Car Week, here's a little historical episode for you all about Elizabeth Taylor's Lincoln Continental. This may not be a Batmobile, this may not be a DeLorean, this may not have any kind of props or fins or anything on it, but everyone can appreciate a beautiful car and that's what this is. It's not Ford from today, it's Continental from yesterday. My name is Robert Ratnoff, and I run Classic Auto Rental Services. We rent cars in the motion picture industry for basically high-end automobiles for uh, any type of production. And my claim to fame is that I specialize in cars that no one else can get. The most prestigious car I have is my 56 Continental Mark II. That's Liz Taylor's car, Lizzie. Not knowing when I bought her that she was Liz Taylor's car, I was looking for a Mark II, always dreamed of having a Mark II. And I had run across this car in the Lincoln Owners Club, and it was a very unusual color. deep blue, which I've never seen before. It sort of caught my eye. And I showed my wife and I said, uh, what do you think about this car? And she goes, oh, I like it. We sort of fell in love with the color. So I called the owner and we had talked and he told me about the car and I said, what about the color? He said, well, the color was special ordered. I purchased the car. I'm reading through the notes and the car had been completely restored in 1975. And by the way, this car was ordered for Elizabeth Taylor and specifically ordered to match the color of her eyes. And I'm like, oh. Speaking to people who had seen the car with her, um, one gentleman said, I know the car quite well. My mother worked at the studios and was executive assistant. And she's the one basically who had put the order together with Lincoln Continental for, uh, for the car. So one would say this is a 1956 Lincoln Continental, but the truth is it's not really a Lincoln. Um, Continentals were actually their own branch. They were built to be luxury cars. A lot of people have said that the Lincoln, a lot of people have said that the Continental is actually supposed to be the American Rolls Royce. This was a car to the stars. This car was given out to many, many movie stars. Elvis Presley had one, Rita Hayworth had one, and of course, Elizabeth Taylor had this one. So you'll notice there's a big, big celebrity list of who owned that car. And they were sort of handed out, I would say freely, but they sort of like, yeah, you're somebody, we want to see you in this car. They were striving for the best American car built, and we will paint it any color you want. You will have, you know, this car's hand built. The Lincoln Continental was meant to be the American Rolls Royce. These were promised to be absolutely flawless, faultless cars. It was so cared for right out of the factory that it was delivered to dealers in a fleece lined bag, a car in a bag. This is almost like when you buy a nice pair of shoes, they give you a really nice soft bag to go with it because when you put it away, you want it to be taken care of. They did that with these cars. Continental was the premier division. Lincoln was their high-end division to compete with Cadillac, Chrysler. The Mark II was a completely different car. It didn't look like anything else in the line. So it had a different quality than the actual other cars that Ford built. This car was a hand-built American car. On the nose of the hood, there's actually the classic Lincoln logo. 
And now what most people don't know is that this is the first car that actually used it. And so from here on, even though it wasn't really a Lincoln, Lincoln took it and just rolled with it. This is not the typical American car. This is, this is a cut above the American car. I have a 56 Cadillac. And I'll be honest with you, the drive can't compare to that car. The styling is much cleaner and nicer. And the way it drives and the way it brakes is far superior than my 56 Cadillac. It has good power. It's just finished much nicer. There's a lot of leather in the car. They used uh, Bridge Weir, which is a high-end high -end leather. They used wool carpet. The car had, was peppy, and it certainly, I think, could do well over 100 miles an hour. And you would easily get there. The car was powerful enough. We stepped on the gas and it moved. Okay, let's see how it goes. Yeah. It's soft in, the, in its acceleration and it feels like floaty, but it goes. It goes. <laughs> so I think it was, it was built for being a comfortable drive, an easy drive, and a well-recognized drive. And driving around in residential areas, the quiet residential areas of the valley, kind of makes it feel right at home. It's not a place where you need to drive fast. You can actually kind of cruise nice and easy, smooth, and just, I don't know, enjoy the day. Because it's one of those cars where you can actually enjoy the drive, where you're not kind of pressed to push it to its limits. It's really just about enjoying yourself in the car, rather than trying to see if you can break a car. And also you notice about the car, there's, there's very little chrome on the car as compared to a lot of the other cars built in that era. Uh, the Fords and the Cadillacs had a lot of chrome. And, uh, GM loved using chrome. And this car is sort of quietly elegant. Didn't need all that chrome to make it look pretty. Had a beautiful body line to it. It had that quality of being reserved and yet you knew it had class. The whole point was to make the penultimate American luxury car. And driving this car, looking at all the beautiful little details in the design of this car, it absolutely fulfills that niche, that requirement to be the best of the best in the American market. Places you can find that is this beautiful radius windshield, the dashboard covered in leather, the gas filler, which is behind the rear light, which is on a double hinge that swings out. I mean, these days, if a Ford had something like that, it would break in about three months, and then you'd have to get a warranty service. In the 1950s, on a Lincoln, it was built to be operated with one finger. The color was made specifically to match Elizabeth Taylor's eyes. And if you look at a color of her eyes, a real picture, and I've seen her eyes, and they're a deep blue, very pretty blue and the color almost is identical natural. So I've had a few wanted to come up and, you know, what, what color is that? And unofficially, I call it Taylor Blue. They wanted to try to match the car. They wanted the formula. And um, I refused because the car is unique. Lincoln made a MKZ in 2013 to match Lizzie. And they went and they had to get the paint from my shop to match that paint specifically to what was on there. We went back to the firewall, we went back to down to the primer of the car. And to get the color right, it took us about three or four months. And the unusual property of the color originally was the color changes in the light. Now naturally, a lot of cars do that, but this car changes color. So it goes what I call Elizabeth Taylor's color, her eyes, in the light, but in the dark, it becomes a deep blue. But there's no pearl in it. It's a fine metallic blue. The paint was expensive. It was $3,500 for a gallon of the paint. But I think they ordered two gallons of it. I was invited up to Pebble Beach with Lizzie and the new MKZ. I went over to, uh, to get a drink over at the quail, and this young man comes up next to me. 
could have been more than 30. And he comes up and he goes, are you Mr. Ratnoff? And I said, yes, I am. He goes, I have to tell you, I really love your car. It's absolutely fantastic. I go, well, thank you. He goes, I'm Henry Ford III. I said, nice meeting you. <laughs> here's a person, here's a family that is so rich in car history that someone comes up to you and says, that's a beautiful car. So it was one of those wonderful moments where you're going, God, this is, this is great. You'll never find anyone who doesn't know who Elizabeth Taylor was. And the fact that I'm driving Elizabeth Taylor's car, this is, it's amazing. This, Elizabeth Taylor was a legend. She was an icon. She's one of Hollywood's most important leading ladies. From my understanding, um, she wasn't much of a driver, but um, the car was meant for her to be seen in. And she was actually uh, seen it at the 57 Academy Award. She drove up in it. I think she had a lot, of, a lot of things going on that year. In 1956, Giantess came out. It was a fantastic hit. She was getting a divorce from Michael Wilding. She was dating Michael Todd, which will, would become her third husband. So there was a lot of turmoil, and I don't think the car was the highlight of her life. It was, it was tumultuous for her. She was very, very busy with a lot of personal things. There's a few photos of her uh, in the car. Probably the most famous is her getting out of the car at the Academy Awards. This really is a car you can go cruising in. It's a car that, that you just, you feel like you're back in the 50s. There's different reasons I like cars. A lot of it's the styling. I just love how it looks. It may not be the best car they ever built, but I like it. Um, it might be a mechanical hallmark. Some of them were icons. The 61 Continental that I have convertible, that's an iconic car. So it was, a, it was like falling in love. You can't really explain it. And today, in this world, there's very few things that drive me in that way, but not the old cars. And the old cars you have passion for. It's like they had styling. People had worked on this to make it and make it right, rather than punched out of a cookie cutter. So that's the difference of owning a classic car. It does make you feel like maybe the, back in the 50s, you know, things were better. <laughs> it started as a young boy because my dad always loved cars, and following suit, I came to love cars. I remember going to the different dealerships when I was young, and he wanted to see the new cars. So every year we go look at, you know, the, the new model that came out. My dad loved cars, and he had a number of classic cars over his years, but we had very limited room where we lived at the time. So we usually had one special car. Uh, my dad really liked an eclectic group of cars. The uh, Mark II was probably one of his favorites. I'm sure I bought that car because my dad always wanted one. My dad was uh, murdered in the 92 riots in LA, and it hurt very much. So a lot of the cars I have bought since his passing were cars that he wanted to make him feel a little closer to him. He, he made me understand how to appreciate the car, and the Mark II definitely was one of them, the 61 Continental, the, uh, the Skyliner, were all cars that he wanted and actively looked for, but never found the time to buy it, um, never wanted to start a project. You know, he was my dad. You know, some people's relationships with their fathers are very different. My relationship with my father was very good and uh, I felt that he was uh, taken away from me early, but also I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. This is my sort of way to soothe my heart and know he's still with me. And keeping these cars alive is an important endeavor that needs to be preserved. That, that's not a sentence idea, it makes sense. Electronic windows. And this is a 1950s car, look how fast that is. I'm amazed. The motors on my Ford, my, my Ford Mustang, are already going out, and this is a 1950s car with absolutely perfect controls. And I love the fact that this one's motorized. I love the fact that this one is motorized. So cool.